Um, we're going to be talking um, very briefly about risk assessments because I I'm, I'm sure you guys all are already aware of what risk assessments are and how they're done. So I want to talk specifically about some things that I see overlooked often when they're being done that end up being really significant. And then we're going to dive into safeguarding machinery. And again, I'm not going to talk about the entire world of machine safeguards. We're going to dive into kind of the everyday production machinery and tools you see in almost every facility, whether it's a hospital maintenance shop or an actual fabrication facility. Um, and so we'll dive into those, even though most of the concepts are applicable to all machinery. For those of you that don't know me, I've met Joe and I think maybe a couple others of you at uh, some trade shows before. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Make Safe Tools. We make uh, a, a safety device that is an easy retrofit to power tools and other equipment. Um, but I also have a pretty diverse background. So I'm on the safety side. I'm also an engineer. Um, I've also been in education. I've worked with lots of different agencies. We have pending um, petitions with Cal OSHA. And so we are kind of in the weeds of things. And it gives us, I think, an interesting perspective. And I'm also like a hands-on person, right? Like, I, I don't know if I would hire me for professional production, but I'm a you know, pretty decent machinist and carpenter and all those things. So I've worked with tools my whole life. And I, I like to talk about kind of why, why I do these free webinars, right? So like, you'll notice, like I talk about product a very tiny bit, like this is really mostly um, education. And it's for a couple of reasons. One, when I first got in this industry, I started looking at the data, right? What data is available about how injuries happen, when they happen. And I, the things that disturbed me were not the magnitude of injuries, even though those are disturbing, but that um, if we just look at machinery, machinery, machinery related injuries that resulted in missed days from work, not counting fatalities, there's about 40,000 a year. And the concerning part is that's been exactly the same for 10 years. There's not a reduction. There's not a downward trend. And that was a little bit concerning, especially when I started, you know, learning that, oh, and then, as we know, machine guarding um, has been one of the top 10 uh, most common citations since they started tracking that in 2002. And so it's like, okay, we know what causes the injuries. We know how to implement those safeguards and people still don't do it. And so that's kind of frustration is what led me into this. Um, and then I also started seeing things that um, in the industry that were troubling to me. So I'm gonna kind of go through a metaphor really quick or a thought experiment. So um, imagine for a moment that you are, let's say, taking care of an elderly parent. And, you know, a doctor says, oh, you know, your elderly parent has um, heart disease, so I'm going to prescribe you this medication. You know, they're taking that medication for a while and things aren't going well. And, and you find out that, well, actually, the doctor prescribed a medication that's not actually for heart disease, right? It's for something else. That might be a little frustrating as someone who expected that an FDA-regulated drug from a professional is not being used for its intended purpose, right? Then imagine for a moment that that drug you find out not only is not intended for that purpose, but says on the label, not for use with heart disease and elderly patients, right? You would be pretty pissed off um, if someone was using that and putting a loved one's safety at risk. But what we're gonna find out a little later in the presentation is that's exactly what's happening with safety products right now. Products are being sold for a safety purpose that are explicitly not for that purpose. Um, and that causes additional hazards in industry um, and injuries. And that's part of our petition, which I'll talk about a little bit. So um, again, the things I'm gonna be talking about conceptually cover all sorts of machinery, um, but we are gonna be focusing kind of on this power tools and machine tools area, um, just cause it gives us a little bit of focus for today. Now, um, risk assessments. Everyone has their own flavor. Um, I'm sure you guys probably have your own even in-house risk assessments. You might even be recommending them to your clients. But um, for this, just quick dis description, I'm gonna be using UL's risk assessment. I don't know if you guys know, UL has kind of also become a safety company now, like outside of their normal role. Um, and they actually have a decent webinar. I've got a link down there, um, a little bit technical, but um, good to forward to clients if, if you're interested. But uh, when we're looking at a risk assessment like this, I just wanna point out a few things that I see overlooked as people do these, you know, when they do them, which they don't all, always. One is this kind of like part at the top, right? And it's so easy to think like, oh, it's like middle school and I'm taking a quiz and I'm gonna put my name at the top and be done with it. 
But this is something that is, I would argue sometimes the most important part of a risk assessment that never gets any attention. Um, and so there's a few things. One, um, figuring out what the piece of machinery is. That sounds so obvious, I know. I was giving a workshop recently um, at the uh, UCSD OSHA Training Center, and I was working with um, uh, a lady that's been in this industry for a long time, and she works at, at a Navy base, and her fundamental job is helping with safety in machine shops. And uh, we were, you know, I brought in equipment, we were doing um, kind of like mock risk assessments, and was really kind of, she was not understanding, and I was having trouble figuring out why. And I, I finally realized why. She was applying the, um, trying to apply the bandsaw requirements to a bench grinder. And so this was someone, you know, their role is safety, but they didn't, they weren't even sure what piece of equipment it was. Um, and that's something that's not as uncommon as you'd think. And so this is where kind of knowing what that equipment is and also having people on the team that have that diversity, right? You have someone that knows the safety, also somebody that knows the machinery and the use cases and how it gets used in that business. Again, sounds obvious, but I find a lot of the time this is one person doing a run through that doesn't involve other people. Um, and so this is also as insurance people, if you're looking through binders is a good thing to check. You kind of like, oh, is it the same name on the top of every risk assessment with no one else mentioned? Hmm, that's interesting. Now, uh, other piece just is location. So again, people think that's trivial. They'll say building five, right? That doesn't mean anything. Um, and this was kind of uh, um, a big deal for me when, when I was visiting a client, a, an aerospace um, customer. And um, there, there was a few things going on with them, but one of them was they had a, um, we walk into their facility through the loading dock and I say, oh, you know, that, that's a huge disc sander. What do you guys use that for? And he said, oh, we haven't used that thing in years. So, oh, okay, keep walking through. Um, and on our, my way out exiting the building, I saw um, somebody using the disc sander in a way they shouldn't have been, but they're also using it in the thoroughfare of the loading dock. So people are walking right behind them, carrying boxes, limited visibility, and that is a very significant part of that hazard there because someone can get bumped into it and that location is a big part of that risk assessment. Um, and it's one of those things, again, where really being specific um, can be really helpful. Um, then of course, the job hazard analysis, this, we're gonna go into this, uh, some specific hazards that we, we see overlooked often, um, but this is again where that other person on the team matters. So um, depending on the workplace, their uh, communication between safety side and production side may be great, maybe non-existent, it's kind of all over the board. So really making sure that um, whoever's conducting the risk assessment is aware of the things being done um, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as the kind of related hazards. So um, another just quick example is uh, in that same customer, um, they you know, thought that machine wasn't even being used and one of its primary uses was for grinding the heads of nails off for the people taking pallets apart. Um, not what you should be using a disc sander for, right? But nobody knew that until they started asking around. So again, it's one of those things where it seems obvious, but it's one of the things I, I often see a, a gap in. Um, and since you guys are more technical, I'm not gonna dive into um, this part, but just this kind of represents the, the transition from you know, avoiding all injury to numerical risk profiles. And I know not everybody agrees with that kind of conceptually, but that is where all the standards have gone. Um, and so uh, the part of this I will call out is that when, when we're doing these assessments and um, putting in the numbers, doing the calculation, there are a number of different standards you can use. I'd have to look up which one UL uses. But the thing I've seen um, OSHA inspectors get stuck on is they'll see something like this and they'll be like, okay, I see a three, an eight, a five, a one. What's your risk threshold as a business? And people say, whoa, whoa, whoa what do you mean? Um, and that what OSHA often expects is that you actually have a number that's written down somewhere that says, hey, you know, anytime we see over a seven, we as a business are going to mitigate and try and bring it below a seven, right? And obviously if you chose a 17, people are, that's not gonna work. But um, biz businesses are able to kind of set their threshold of what is a quote unquote acceptable risk. Conceptually, you might disagree with that, but that's what I've seen in practice. 
Um, and then lastly, we all know about hierarchy of controls. Um, but the thing that I, I often see missed is people don't actually inspect and follow up on safeguards. So whether it's something that's being done in house, right? You've recognized a bunch of hazards, you've recommended some mitigations for them, and no one actually checked. Did the safety professionals request at the very beginning that you know went through purchasing, turned into a quote, went out to vendors, got work done, came back, got installed by someone, is it still what they expected? Does it actually reduce the risk? And are you there signing off as the safety professional saying it did? Because if you don't do that, the entire rest of the process is useless from a kind of a liability perspective because no one actually confirmed that any of it worked. Um, and as you kind of dig into complexity on these safeguard systems, the, um, it is a surprising amount of, um, of like if this, then that checks, especially if you're in the functional safety realm. Um, so again, one of those things where you, you want to make sure things are kind of getting checked off at the end. Um, and of course, then part of that is saying, yes, and now the, there is no longer a hazard or the hazard is significantly reduced. So that was just a fast forward through a couple things of risk assessments. What we're going to be spending most of today on is um, a few things I see overlooked on the hazard analysis side, the more practical side, and then how to kind of select these mitigations and a few things I've seen. So pausing there for a sec, did um, um, anyone see anything, have any questions? Is this new? Is this all kind of stuff you already know? There was one question in the chat, I think. Oh, okay. Um, um, so good question about the, the number of machines and employees working on machinery. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to go double check that to see if there is a correlation. Um, if memory serves, I, uh, I, we also have the per thousand workers statistics and that is the same kind of flat line, but I need to go double check that um, and I can follow up with you on that. Um, so uh, for this kind of hazardous analysis side, right? You can call it a job hazard analysis. You can call it a number of different things, but really it's the, um, when you're using a certain piece of machinery, like what are the things that um, not only that can go wrong, but what are the um, things that represent a hazard to an operator or people nearby when um, things do eventually go wrong? So this, again, getting to that data. So um, I will get back to you guys on the other one with my follow-up email, but just looking at kind of this, this data trend over time. And this, again, is not representing the scrapes and lacerations that people band-aid and like, it's not representing any of that, right? This is just the um, like rep reported miswork kind of injuries and it's not fatalities. Um, so just for some perspective, and, and when we think about this, that that um, by population, if you just think about Los Angeles, that means 1100 injuries a year in just LA. Like that is mind blowing. Um, and that's every single year. And this is where uh, I think this might be new for people. So we dig a lot into um, when injuries happen and on what kinds of machinery. So when you look at the kind of profile of when injuries happen, um, they, they break it down. And this is all from the IIF, the Injury, Illness, and Fatality Database. It's published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And they, um, when you look at this, you see grinding and polishing at the top. And so if you ask most people what the kind of number one um, cause of injury would be, most would say presses, right? And presses are definitely on here. They're a huge part. But right next to that is grinding and polishing. And grinding and polishing, for whatever reason, whether you're talking about buffers or bench grinders or surface grinders, those tend to be seen as, you know, not super hazardous machines. That's not someone that's, that's not a machine that people are super cautious around. Um, and part of that um, is because, um, at least on the, the grinder side, they tend to be a little less expensive and people for some reason associate that with less risk. Um, but it's, it, this kind of stood out to us. It wasn't quite what we expected. And of course, it's government data. So there are big holes and we don't, there's a lot of unreported things. 
um, but we would assume that that is across the spectrum um, relatively evenly. Um, and so the other things we see in there are kind of the drills, mills, um, planers, things like that, that again, you like you know they're hazardous, but you wouldn't expect them to be higher on the list. Um, and I think this is interesting because we tend to associate high risk with large machinery. And when we think about the grinders and the sanders, like as the small stuff, we don't necessarily spend the same amount doing safety on that little stuff. So if we had better data, right? Now this is never granular enough to do this kind of analysis, but if we were to compare the kinds of machinery injuries happen on to the amount of money spent on safeguards for machinery, my guess is those would not overlap well and that there um, is this huge world of smaller machines that have either zero safeguards um, or very few. And so that's an interesting, especially from the insurance perspective, kind of an interesting disconnect of where um, spend is going versus where injuries are happening. And then that gets even more kind of convoluted when we think about when are those injuries happening. So if you think about, again, injuries on machinery, that during regular operation, right? So if it's a saw, it's when you're sawing. If it's a sander, it's when you're doing your kind of production operation is this orange part, right? So you're caught in the machinery during operation. That's less than half of the injuries. And if we think about when we're doing risk assessments, do people really think about um, hazards outside of the time that someone is doing the operation, right? If I'm doing a, um, a risk assessment on a surface grinder, right? Obviously they're gonna be doing, most people would include that you know they're moving the table back and forth, all those parts but less people would include the, we're setting up the work, we're putting things on the magnetic chuck, we're um, you know, owning, owning the wheel, we're doing all those other parts. And what we find is that between maintenance and kind of these other possibilities, that's more than half of injuries. And so when we're doing our risk assessments, that should be half or more of our consideration, um, which is not what we're seeing. And um, when we start, um, peeling those things apart. So everything I've shown you so far is um, like formal data, right? Here we're getting into a little more inference because what we do is we've, we see the formal data statistics, but we've read through hundreds and hundreds of OSHA incident reports, right? And they have varying levels of specificity. But from that, we've seen these kind of major categories emerging as things that are causing those kind of other injuries, right? That kind of other 50%. And so obviously lockout, tag out, that's not a surprise to anybody. Um, accidental restart, which is very related to um, lockout, tag out. Um, coasting tools. So um, by this, I mean, you're using, um, let's go with the uh, surface grinder, right? So surface grinders tend to have a big grinding wheel that's almost fully enclosed on top. Um, they have a lot of uh, kind of rotational inertia. And so what happens is you turn the machine off and people will often start reaching for a magnetic chuck and don't remember that that wheel is going to spin for another three minutes and it gets the top of their hand, right? And luckily that's often a, loss, a laceration and not an amputation or anything. Um, but you go into some other machines, like some of the larger, like a bandsaw with large rotating um, cast iron wheels, those coast for a long time. And if you think about um, a bandsaw again specifically, the first thing we're all th taught to do whether you're um, in the production world or you're learning in wood shop, people are taught that the first thing they should do to be safe is to adjust the blade guard, right? You walk up to a tool, you adjust the blade guard to be about a quarter inch above your material. But guess what? If someone else used that tool recently, that could still be spinning. You have no visual cue because it might be a fine tooth blade. There's no auditory cue because it's pretty silent. And the first thing you're taught to do is reach for the blade. That blows my mind, right? So there should be an expectation that when you walk away from a piece of equipment, it's not hazardous anymore. Um, and then lastly is e-stop, right? You, you can argue um, about if e-stop is formally required, right? I would argue in California, it's a little more easy to argue, but it isn't explicitly required in most um, regulations. 
Um, if you can um, show some that it doesn't represent an extra hazard and things like that. So, um, but that's something where if you think about a, a something like a, a bench grinder that has a black rocker switch on a black background with the little one and zero symbol, and you're thinking, you know, something bad is happening and I have a second to avert this crisis. I, I can never remember as an electrical engineer if the one or the zero is off and it's black on black and it's just, it's, it's not likely you're gonna be able to hit that. And so um, one of the benefits of an e-stop of course is that it is a standard big red button um, that has performance requirements. So given that, um, we've talked about kind of when those injuries happen, right? What about the compliance side? And this is where most um, organizations get lost. And um, my personal belief is that um, while I understand why we have these things, this complexity is one of the, um, the biggest obstacles for compliance. As someone that does this full time, I'm constantly learning new things and finding things I didn't know and some different interpretations. And so as a well-meaning safety professional to go in on multiple kinds of machinery and really be able to cite all of these different standards, how they intermix as well as best practices, which may or may not be the same as the standards. Um, and so it's really this kind of strange space. And so on the right here, this kind of service and maintenance, right? Machines kind of starting up unexpectedly is the big thing. And this was the why uh, lockout tagout um, came to be because people were seeing huge amounts of um, injuries in this kind of service and maintenance space. And I'm gonna give myself a little pointer so I can point. Here we go. Um, so yeah, this side over here is um, service and maintenance, lockout, tagout. We're not gonna dig into that. I think there's a lot of literature on that already. Then on this side is kind of this normal machine guarding requirement. Everything that we would normally expect from um, the machine guarding standards with this one funky little minor servicing exception, which is an uh, exception to lockout, tagout, and could be its own presentation. Uh, but where we're really gonna kind of focus today is in this middle area. So we have um, service and maintenance, which is planned. We have normal production, which is planned. We know what's gonna happen. And then we have all the Murphy's Law, right? Whether someone's making a mistake or there's a defect in the material or power is lost or you trip a breaker, and this is where um, that kind of other 50% is often happening, right? It's not the everyday thing. It's not maintenance. It's the, we don't really have this area defined well section. Um, and a lot of this is explicitly covered by machine guarding, though not often implemented. And then we also have nationally recognized test labs, um, which we'll be talking about a little bit more later, who should be kind of making sure that equipment can operate as it's designed in this space. And then we also have electrical codes. So um, NFPA 70 and 79, for example, both require um, uh, restart prevention so that in, after a loss of power, a machine will not restart. However, we still don't see that in most small machinery. Um, and so it's, it's, it's one of those things where people get lost in the noise, but we're gonna just focus a little bit on this area right now. So we know about the, the hierarchy of controls. Um, we know uh, OSHA has general requirements. I'm sure you guys are familiar with these. Um, the parts of this I wanna dive into just quickly is this kind of, kind of general catch-all, right? Basically, we're gonna protect people from everything on all machines in every way, right? And so this can be the catch-all for citations um, when someone, when an inspector knows something like was hazardous but can't quite put their finger on why, they'll often cite these standards. And a couple of things that are interesting in there, one is the mention of during the operating cycle. And so in talking with a few inspectors, this uh, they say is very intentional to cover those kind of non-normal use times, right? So we're not just protecting the one operator at the time that they are operating the saw, we're also worried about the receptionist who walks into the shop and taps you on the shoulder wearing maybe a, a, a loose shawl to tell you that you have a phone call, right? Like we need to be thinking about the whole picture 
Um, so that's all, all the other employees as well as this whole operating cycle. Um, and so it sounds semantic, but it is an intentional inclusion of these other times that are during an operation, <clears throat> excuse me, like I have here, like when you're setting up for an operation, when you're cleaning up and shutting down after an operation, also those kind of when things go awry, which they do, um, also in after power loss and emergencies. So, right, these, these parts are all regulated. These are a little bit more gray. And so OSHA does have the right in their um, regulation to say, um, you know, these are things you should have been watching out for. And this isn't even talking about if we go into machine specific standards and um, some of the ANSI machine specific standards, which call out even more um, for every machine. And then, of course, there's the human reality, um, which is doesn't matter what your standard or what your uh, safeguard is. If it gets in the way, it will not be there very long. I hear day after day after day that, oh yeah, we, you know, we spent uh, $500,000 outfitting our shop with all these custom guards. And two months later, you know, oh, one of the panels is gone. A month after that, oh, a fuse blew. So they unplugged that thing. And then before you know it, you're in this gray area again which um, some could argue is even worse than where you started because now you're somewhere in between compliance and non-compliance and nobody knows what to expect. Um, and then of course we have to, there has to be a, a company making money or none of us are employed. Um, and so this is something that is kind of the founding principle of, of my company is how do we make things that, that perform like they should as a safeguard that um, don't get in the way and maybe even improve the actual day-to-day -day process for an operator um, and aren't crazy expensive, excuse me. <clears throat> so how do we mitigate against these things, right? So I talked about a few major things. We talked about, for example, the anti-restart. We talked about um, braking. We talked about e-stop. So let's focus on those um, just for a sec. Lockout, tag out. Um, I think they're going to be better resources than me for this. And so I'm not going to dive into this. Um, I assume you guys have experts on this in-house. Um, obviously an important part. I would um, also check out that minor servicing exception. Um, there are lots of articles on it. Um, we're not going to dig into it here. Breaking. Um, so we talked about coasting, right? Tools coast. Now, there are a number of ways you can mitigate against this. Some equipment, like a bandsaw or a lathe, um, will have a mechanical brake built in, right? like this bandsaw, right? You have a pedal that's actually electrically interlocked, so it turns off the machine when you press it. And um, you can hold that down and it will stop the machine. Um, definitely better than nothing. A few comments on it though, is if you think about the hierarchy of controls, that is a manual action at the end of an operation. And so that's an administrative control actually, because that's your requirement as a company would be, hey everybody, don't forget, to you know, put your foot on the brake when you're done using the bandsaw or before you take a measurement on the lathe. Because you know what the most common brake for a lathe is? Someone's hand on the chuck. Um, and so uh, when we're thinking about these, definitely better than nothing, but we wanna go into that kind of automated space. Also, I've heard some interesting things in my many days at customer sites. One is, um, this is, I've heard this now twice, is that operators say they they go, no, we never use that um, foot brake. And I say, why? And they say, because that's for emergencies and we don't want to wear it out. That was news to me, right? But I've heard it twice now. So it's something that people believe. Um, the second is, oh, the uh, little brake pad wore out 30 years ago and we never replaced it, right? That's especially true for lathes, you know, who that last so long nowadays. Um, some people get creative and they DIY solutions. I would not recommend that in a professional space. Um, and you can of course make a custom control cabinet that would do whatever you want, including breaking. Um, but when you're talking about a $80 grinder or a thousand dollar bandsaw, no one's gonna drop three or $4,000 on custom controls. They just don't do it. Um, and then there's uh, things like our product, which does breaking that we'll get into in a little bit as well. Um, and there's kind of, the cross between friction braking and then also electronic motor braking, which we'll talk about. 
Secondly, restart prevention. And just to kind of clarify what this is, I'm specifically talking about if power is lost as a result of a blackout or tripping a circuit breaker or um, having an overload condition, right? Power disappears for some reason. And then when the power returns, whether it's because someone reset a breaker or the utility came back on, most machines will just restart because they are still, their on switch is still in the on position. And so that is how most machines um, kind of come from the factory, especially on the smaller side. And so um, NFPA, ANSI, OSHA, everybody requires that that does not happen, yet it still does all the time. Um, and this goes by a lot of names. You might see it called safe start, low voltage dropout. These are all related. If you hear, I've heard about a magnetic switch that's helping with this problem. And there's a number of uh, directions you can go. All the way from this tiny little switch over here, that's about 20 bucks, that is a completely legitimate retrofit as a magnetic switch to a bandsaw or other tool. It's in fact, if you buy a bandsaw that has a magnetic switch, this is the exact one it will probably have. It's a Chinese company called Kdu. They uh, supply basically every power tool switch um, that's commercially sold. Um, and the one interesting note though, is that their magnetic and non-magnetic switches look identical. So unless you actually test the equipment or you pull it out and look at a model number, there's no way to know. Um, there's also a few plug and play um, anti-restart devices that I'm going to be giving some cautions about in a moment. Um, there is a what's called a UL508 control panel. Everybody sells these. Um, so any safety provider you have, you can um, get a hold of one of these, a couple hundred dollars, no big deal. Um, they're great. They, a lot of these have e-stop and the restart prevention. Um, you can buy other inline products. And of course, our product also does um, restart prevention. Um, so we'll be talking about why these are maybe not the best. These two on the bottom aren't a, a good plan. And then, of course, emergency stop. So um, emergency stop, as I mentioned, you can argue on different machinery, whether it's required or not. But um, what I have seen lately on the small machines, like the, the shop tools, is there is an increase in the number of citations for both anti-restart and e-stop. Um, and I, I can't explain why. My guess is that it's a little bit of the changing of uh, the guard of OSHA inspectors. You've probably seen, um, as you guys encounter inspectors, a lot of them are in their 60s, now bringing on someone in their like 20s and 30s, kind of training them up. Um, and that's happening across the industry. And so um, what I suspect is that uh, someone with not a lot of experience walks into a shop and they go to what's familiar, right? They go to the small tools because they, they, they have a little more traction. They, they, they're a little more informed of what to do with those. And so these smaller tools are getting more citations. And you can, of course, do a custom control cabinet. Um, you can actually, in some cases, do just a momentary foot switch. So OSHA has specific code clarifications where on things like a um, pipe threader, they say a momentary action foot switch can meet the needs of anti-restart and e-stop. Again, not every case, but is an interesting kind of exception um, and gets us into that like, oh, that's an easy fix. That's a low hanging fruit that we can sometimes apply. Um, if you wanna get really fancy, you can have the wireless e-stops and that freaks me out a little bit. They're real products, they exist, apparently they work. Um, and again, you can get into these uh, control panels. And what I often recommend with e-stops is depending on the um, actual piece of machinery, you can have more than one. And it's normally really doesn't cost much different. For example, if you're um, a lumber company and you're uh, using large band saws and you're often resawing, chances are there's someone on kind of the feed side and someone on the other side. And so the person kind of maybe holding and supporting material if you're um, resawing a large piece of lumber they don't necessarily have access to turning that machine off. So if something goes wrong, they're helpless. Um, and so that, that's an easy case for just put another series e-stop on the other side of the machine. Probably cost you $50 and you, you um, significantly reduce um, kind of the, the chance of a hazard getting really bad. And then uh, again, our product um, also um, does e-stop. Now, um, when you're doing those mitigations, right? Let's say you're like, um, you're at the point where you say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm ready to start shopping now, right? We did our risk assessment. 
and um, it's time to, to figure out what we're going to buy. I'm going to tell a quick story. Um, so I have a, uh, another aerospace fastener company um, that's a customer. They came to me because they had realized that they, um, they have a grinders at each of their CNC operator stations that they use for um, sharpening tooling. And I was a little surprised that they, <laughs> they were um, using like high speed steel tooling on some of these CNC machines. But um, so they have 70 grinders and they realized that they needed anti-restart prevention. So they bought a commercially available UL listed um, anti-restart device. And they were doing something kind of amazing, which everyone should do, but very few do which is um, looking through and testing their safety equipment every month, right? And so in that testing, they realized that between one and three of these brand new devices were failing every month. So just a quick visualization of what that looks like. Every month, a couple more are no longer protected. And with this particular failure, there was no other evidence. Only in testing it, did they realize that it had failed? Um, it had failed in the closed position, um, meaning that just the tool worked normally, but if there had been a restart, it wouldn't have worked. Um, and so that is terrifying. Um, and that um, I started looking into, and like any good engineer, I took one apart and started kind of going through the things of like, why would that happen? This, and so first of all, I look at electrical ratings, right? And so one of the first steps always is seeing if like, does, is it technically, um, going to work. So, uh, um, and in this one, I also looked for the uh, the test lab rating. So, uh, this one has um, it's uh, has a relay inside it, the primary switching part, right? Which is uh, UL recognized, CSA, and TUV recognized. The product itself was UL listed. Okay, so couldn't be that. Um, it's rated for the right voltage. That's fine. It's rated. Um, above the current of this motor. So you, a, a very well-meaning safety professional will say, this is a product that works. Like, this looks like it would work with my machine. And if you look at the marketing for these products, they're covered in pictures of band saws and table saws and all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't work. And there's a reason why. Electrically, um, motors as a load are notoriously um, kind of difficult loads. They store energy in a magnetic field. And if any of you remember doing this little experiment on the right when you were a kid, I don't know if you remember, but just that little coil you made to make an electromagnet, every time you touch it to the battery, it sparks. Now in real life, every time you turn off a motor, it's also gonna spark. And so inside that relay, there will be an arc like that, which is basically a welding arc every time you break the connection of a motor. And if a relay is not designed to handle that, it won't. It'll destroy it, sometimes in a single operation. Um, and so um, that is why things exist, to, um, to check that relays will be able to handle uh, motor loads. But if we go back to that device, I said it was UL listed. So like, why does that work? And here's the catch. This, that device, and there's others like it, it's not the only one, is UL listed as a, quote, appliance control. So it was tested in a category that is meant for household appliances, such as portable lights and audio video equipment, and actually specifically says not intended for controlling motor operated appliances. So this is bit, going back to that kind of prescription drug example I gave earlier. Here is a product being clearly sold as a safety device for industrial equipment that isn't even, um, recommended for a blender, right? So that blew my mind and made me um, very angry. Uh, and what it should be um, regulated under is what's called UL 508. And this is, there's other standards now too that are um, coming out, but um, industrial control equipment is specifically um, tested to work with motors in an industrial environment. And so just as a quick comparison, the relay, the, the primary switching device, these two, um, relays go into two products that both have a 15 amp rating, right? And this is to scale. So you can see how just like they're beefier, they're built to handle these loads. I mean, so that's why that device was failing. I mean, we're actually filing complaints with UL and all sorts of stuff. So hopefully that'll get better. But this is something we see actually quite often. 
And so the kind of moral of this is when you're looking at specifications, obviously you wanna look at, um, is it listed by a test lab? Because that is an OSHA requirement. All products installed in a workplace that plug in need to be approved by basically an independent third party, which normally means a test lab. Um, and you wanna make sure that it's approved for that purpose, um, which is super important. So we've talked about a lot of things. We're kind of wrapping up now. Um, we've talked about the um, e-stops, accidental restart, and um, braking. And so I wanna give just kind of a, um, this little graph where on the x-axis is cost, um, vertical axis is kind of features. So all the way down at the bottom here, if you're comfortable rewiring something um, or have people that can, you have a UL508 li 508 listed switch that can um, prevent accidental restarts for $20, right? Take someone five minutes to install it. That is low hanging fruit. There's no reason for that not to be on every single machine in a workplace. Now that doesn't cover all standards, but again, it's low hanging fruit. We know that could prevent injuries. That should be everywhere. Um, but if you're not comfortable kind of doing that or people don't want to uh, be modifying machines, you can go up a little bit and get some approved um, anti-restart devices. Notice that we're skipping the ones that, that um, destroy themselves. Um, you can also, as I mentioned, do a foot switch, right? Which you'll have to integrate with a little bit of other controls, but in some uh, cases can count as anti-restart and e-stop. You can also go up to one of those UL508A control boxes. Again, we're in the maybe $400, $500 range now. Um, and these are available from everybody. They're all over the internet. Um, and they're totally legit. Nothing wrong with them. Some you wire yourself, some you literally just plug in. Um, go up a little more. Um, our product, as I mentioned, does the anti-restart e-stop and motor braking. And it's something you just plug into machinery. So if you're going that direction, it's Again, a way for you to get a lot of um, kind of safeguards with it not getting in your way at all. And then of course, you can always build a custom control cabinet. These get pretty expensive, but as you move past kind of simpler machines, this is where you have to go, right? All these things are, are gonna be for the machines that tend to have kind of an on off or a little bit more straightforward um, saws, conveyors, things like that. When you start having more automated systems, you definitely wanna go into the deeper into the standards and do a custom control cabinet. But again, I, I say low hanging fruit a lot, but um, just think about, if you think about every machine and every motor in a facility, how many of them are just simple things? A conveyor that's only used at Christmas, that's just in an on off switch, right? Or a um, bandsaw or a uh, disc sander or a lathe or a mill, they're just motors in a switch, right? So you can protect a lot of those with these simpler things. So. Um, I did talk about um, product a little bit. Um, I'm gonna show this demo and then I'll answer the question I see right there. Um, and this is uh, our product being installed on a, a jet band saucer. My name is Scott Swaley and I'm the founder of Make Safe Tools. We're here at the NSC Expo in San Diego, California. And we're showing our Make Safe Tools power tool brake. So here it is installed on a one and a half horsepower bandsaw. So if you come on in, I'll show you some of its features. One, which is really interesting, is this device is actually just plug and play, meaning that we did not modify this bandsaw. We simply plugged the bandsaw into this device and this device into the wall. That now gives us this control panel down here, which has an ANSI compliant emergency stop and a green start button. And this is our now um, how we control this bandsaw. And I'll show you some normal operation. We can now start the bandsaw. And um, what is really interesting is now when we stop it, we take a bandsaw that typically takes just um, takes about 40 seconds to stop. And if we zoom in on the blade here, you're gonna see that when I press stop now, it actually comes to a complete stop in just one second, making it much safer to operate, making it safe to reach for your uh, cutoffs once you complete an operation. Additionally, this provides a um, accidental restart prevention, meaning that if there's a loss of power, you will not have your tool come on and surprise you, which is an OSHA requirement. And lastly, as we mentioned before, you, you now have a ANSI compliant emergency stop button you can position anywhere that it's convenient. And so with this added to a bandsaw or a branch grinder or a disc sander, you can make your shop safer without having to worry about installs, electricians, or anything like that. And I see a question in the chat about um, how does that, how does our device do motor braking? So it uses something called DC injection. 
And so it uses the motor itself as a brake. And so everything's electronic. It's sending a, um, a, a signal into the, into the motor that makes it basically resist rotation. That's something that's very common in VFDs and large industrial machinery. Uh, we did not invent DC injection braking. Our innovation is just bring it, making it small and plug and play. Um, and uh, so um, going back to just our kind of last wrap up here is um, we've talked about a lot of things, kind of the, some of the summaries are some things maybe you could share with clients. One is for risk assessments, right? A lot of people still don't do them. Uh, if, you, if you want a like nice technical complete walkthrough of them, I think that UL webinars not bad, put in your email, it's free. Um, uh, we also do kind of a hands-on simplified version of a uh, risk assessment workshop. We've done, we do it with the UCSD um, training, OSHA training center here. Um, and we found that's useful. Um, if it's in person, we normally bring in small machinery and we like actually do it, um, but we can do a, a version online as well. Um, and then just a reminder for those easy to install mitigations, right? We often think like, how could we, um, right off the bat comply with every single standard everywhere, right? And that normally keeps people from doing anything. And so we always kind of, we're, we're budgeting and planning and kind of intellectually saying, okay, next year we'll do it, next year we'll do it. But there are some low cost and low time ways that you can get that low hanging fruit. You can protect, you can put an e-stop, motor braking and an anti-restart and install it in five minutes and just be done, right? doesn't mean you've eliminated every single possible hazard from that machine, but you're in a much better position. And what we've seen from um, our customers that come to us after getting cited for things, um, OSHA looks very fondly on, here is our kind of three-year process. This is what we've done so far. This is what we're planning to do next. And that shows kind of intent. Um, and then if you have more questions about NRTLs, we also have a whole presentation on that. Um, and there's, uh, a lot more. The OSHA site's actually pretty user-friendly on NRTLs because OSHA is actually the regulator of test labs. Who knew? Um, and then for those uh, mitigations I recommended, um, I said that you, you want to be looking to make sure that uh, it's listed for the purpose. Another thing you can look for is horsepower rating. If it has a horsepower rating, you know it's meant for motors. And so, you know, it'll have amps, it'll have volts, but look for that horsepower. And then um, I know you guys often aren't able to um, recommend products. Um, and so when you, um, it, when clients need this kind of stuff, there's just a couple search terms here uh, that are the kinds of things um, they can search to find, you know, our products or some of the other products that, that we saw. And this category one, all that means is that it's an emergency stop that doesn't just remove power. It actually actively um, breaks and controls kind of the deceleration. So um, obviously we're a product company, but I find myself in this regulation space all the time and I love it and I love doing the research and love helping how I can. So if you or your clients have questions, whether they're related to our product or not, it could just be like, we have this weird case, we want help figuring out what standards apply, feel free to call me, feel free to email me. Um, and that wraps it up. And I hope we still have, a, um, we have about five minutes and I'd love to answer some questions.